Hello. <clears throat> Welcome. My name is Nathan Hatch. This is my stream. I am a health and wellness advocate. Uh, if you are not familiar with my work, there are links below the video that you can check out to learn more about what I do. Uh, today we're going to be talking about vitamin K and its importance in our diet, which is very important. <laughs> uh, so stick around. I give people about uh, five to ten minutes to come trickle in. Um, so if you're watching the VOD, you can skip ahead to the uh, chapter mark where the stream really starts. Um, sometimes we banter beforehand. But uh, yeah, welcome. I will be back shortly to uh, to start. Let me check to make sure this stream is actually working. Yep. Okay. On. And you can hear me. Getting started soon. All right. My microphone accidentally fell up. I don't know if it caught that. Okay, for real, I'll be back in, back soon to start. Hey, Avo. <clears throat> it's nice to be streaming again. Glad you're here. How's your day going? Good. I just got back from a uh, walk outside myself. It's, and then it... And then it rained like a few minutes later <laughs> and it's so weird like because I live in Utah and we're not we don't have like a, uh we usually have dry desert weather but like uh it's so weird for it to be like 95 and raining that doesn't normally happen in here uh I did, not recently um 
I relocated from Los Angeles back to Utah uh, three years ago now. Right, right, right at the beginning of the pandemic. I, I I was planning. I was moving, and then and the pandemic started right when I moved, which was actually really good timing to get out of Los Angeles. <laughs> right then, uh, someone was watching out for me, and um, and so and then I've been in Utah uh, ever since. So. Um, Normally, a, a lot of my stuff still says Los Angeles, though, because I just haven't changed it. <laughs> I've been too busy doing research and and things. Uh, and also, it doesn't matter. I might move, go back to Los Angeles uh, in the future. Uh, uh, I came here more to like write my second book and things like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was nice, and because I moved to a small town in Utah, uh, uh, and. Uh, it was a nice uh it was a nice place to live during the pandemic. It was really quiet. So LA LA is so much fun. Um but there's a lot of problems like uh rent for instance is fucking insane there. Landlords have gone totally apeshit and it's just like not affordable to live there anymore. It's fun to live by the beach though. The people are really nice and uh lots of good food. Um, yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> you're on the West Coast, yeah. There's, um, it, it didn't really affect my life very much, but there's a big cocaine problem in Los Angeles, too. <laughs> and, uh, uh, like, I don't know, like, I don't know, that didn't really affect my life so much, but it makes it a weird city to live in. Like, your landlord will be a cocaine addict, and everybody that works at Amazon are cocaine addicts, and, um, it's just kind of fucked up. Uh, uh, per person or yeah, yeah, for a room, yeah, yeah. I was I was living in a um, literal sardine can, and I was paying thirteen hundred, and then and it went up after I left, and it was literally like it was so small that I didn't even have a closet. Um, I just had room for my bed. And I like I put um, cubbies for my clothes on shelves. It was a really nice minimalist place to live, like you know. But it was uh, it was fucking ridiculous for the prices to keep going up and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, kind of nuts. I miss it. Um, uh, but yeah, and then Utah is like a crazy conservative. Um, weird place. Uh, the Salt Lake City is a lot of fun. There's a lot of. Uh, more normal people here but um the small town like the small town that i moved in literally like a few weeks after i moved in someone fired an ar-15 into my sister's neighborhood and bullets went through the bedrooms of children in the neighborhood next door it was really fucking nuts and people go like you know oh the los angeles you know there must be so much violence like i <laughs> i saw a gun once in los angeles um and sure, there's, you know, sure, there's violence, but the rates are so much lower in big cities just because you've got such a high um, ratio of people to crime that you're actually more experience, more likely to experience crime in a smaller city, um, depending on where you are. Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's still weed a lot in California, which is great. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't really, I don't get the appeal of cocaine. Like, it's, it's just kind of, like, psycho. Um, uh, just, like, smoke pot like a normal person. <laughs> yeah, Salt Lake's fun. Salt Lake City, we have, like, one of the best public transit systems for this size of a city in the whole country. It's amazing it's nice it's brand new the stations are great it goes a lot of places it's so much fun to ride it like i always talk to people when i ride the rail in, in salt lake city um uh yeah and then and, and salt lake's um also on the more affordable side and and everywhere in salt lake has like fiber optic internet too so um uh so uh yeah so it's really good to live here too because i can just hop on a stream and have reliable internet <laughs> uh oh you lived in europe fun yeah um there's no good architecture here in utah we had great architecture in los angeles it was all like old art deco stuff 
Well, it's been 10 minutes, so I guess we should start. Hello, everybody else that's here too, not just to Evo. <laughs> um, if you also don't know how this works, like I, I talk about a, um, I tend to talk about a primary uh, topic and then we move on and then we talk about whatever you guys want to talk about afterwards. So, and you're welcome to talk and ask questions at any time. Um, uh, sometimes I get to questions when they're asked and other times I get, hi, Jay, welcome. Uh, other times I get to them at the end. Um, uh, and, uh, today I wanted to talk about vitamin K. It's not very revolutionary, you know, uh, to talk about this, uh, or exciting. Um, but it's very, very necessary. And a lot of people don't understand, uh, exactly how important it is and what it does for our body. So I thought it might be helpful to, uh, kind of really highlight it and talk more about it, uh, um, for clarity's sake. So I guess I should maybe start at the beginning. So like, you know, a lot of you know that my work is based on Ray Pete's work, whose work is in turn um, based on um, really, you know, giants of biology, um, like Otto Warburg and Albert Sans Gior Georgie, I don't know how to say his last name. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, they're Nobel Prize winning scientists, if if you, you who are listening don't know that. Uh, and, um, a lot of Ray, or a lot of Ray's work, especially talked about how important vitamin K is for a lot of things. And, um, uh, as I started getting better and like reforming my diet and using nutrients to try to improve my cancer and thyroid disease and insomnia and all the other shit that I was dealing with, um, vitamin K became a really important tool, but it was also a little bit elusive. Like it was really hard to kind of tell and understand what I was getting out of the vitamin K as well, because it's not, there are, there are some nutrients that you can take or eat and, um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rest in peace, Ray. Um, uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of nutrients that you can take that have kind of like immediate effects. Like say, I mean, say for instance, it's not a nutrient, but like if you have a cup of coffee, right, you get a thrill, you get a, you get a buzz, you get a boost of energy right away. Uh, if you eat sugar, sugar will give you some energy. Um, vitamin C can also up your respiratory rate very obviously. Um, dosing salts can, can do the same. Going and getting sunshine can, um, ob obviously like within just like half an hour to an hour after sun exposure, you can have an increase in like, um, metabolic temperature and things like that. Vitamin K is a little bit more nebulous. And so uh, I, I think that, I think that kind of gives people a, an, and also as a fat soluble nutrient, like any, um, any of the water soluble nutrients, we don't really store uh, very long, but fat soluble nutrients, we actually can store in our body for very long. So, so one of the things with vitamin K is that you can actually store it in your body for quite a long time. So if you do stop for some reason, or you don't get enough in your diet, if you had a lot in your past, you might actually have reserves that your body is then pulling from. So you can't really tell very obviously what vitamin K is doing for your body. Um, and that makes it harder for a lot of people to really diagnose what's going on with their diets and their health problems. Um, but I promise you that vitamin K deficiency is one of the major ones <laughs> and you probably have a deficiency. And one of the problems with these fat soluble nutrients as well, because they are stored in our body for a long period of time, um, uh, a lot of people don't understand, um, how frequently we need them. And, and, and because a lot of these foods are associated like stereo uh, as stereotypically healthy foods, everyone tries to kind of get like a, a, you know, a minimum quota. Like I, you know, you have to, like, I need to have some greens or, 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 or carotene, um, you know, at least once or twice a week or something like that. And, 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 and that's not enough. Like, um, these fat sol, even though we can store these fat soluble nutrients, um, our body does usually use them quite rapidly as well. So like, um, having an attitude of getting them, getting the minimum that you need is really counterintuitive to getting well because, um, or, or avoiding health problems because they're not optional for our body. Like, um, uh, you know, vitamin A, vitamin K, vitamin E, vitamin D are the major fat soluble nutrients and, um, none of them are optional. 
um, when you get deficiencies of them, very important pathways in the body start to break down and become dysfunctional. So having the attitude of like, oh, as long as I get a minimum, usually you're not meeting that minimum anyway because of the way that our, you know, rationalizing minds work. And we're like, oh, I had a, you know, I had a, oh, I had a, like, I had a good salad a few days ago, I think, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> Um, but also the nature of actually what vitamin K is and what it does is also highly misunderstood in those terms. And so then people don't utilize those foods and nutrients effectively. Um, okay. So fundamentally, like for our own physiology, vitamin K is really, its main purpose is to, um, manage calcium in the body. Um, Vitamin D helps the body absorb calcium, although that is really reductive for what it really does. And then vitamin K helps the body use that calcium. So if you uh, are deficient in vitamin D, you can't really absorb calcium, although you can still, but it uses stress pathway backups like uh, high parathyroid hormone expression. And if you and 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 so then also if you are deficient in vitamin K, you can't really utilize that calcium. So then it doesn't matter how much calcium. Hey, Org, welcome. Nice to see you. Uh, so if you if you if you um so if you're vitamin K deficient, you can't even really use calcium, even if you're taking calcium. So people take like you know people like take a calcium supplement, you know, like eggshell calcium or calcium citrate, um, or you try to eat high calcium foods, um. That doesn't do you any good if you don't have vitamin K in you. Basically, if you don't have vitamin K in your body, your body cannot use calcium. Um, uh, what vitamin K does specifically for this is it you, the body uses vitamin K to do what's called carboxylate proteins. And I don't often use big, use big words like that when, even when I'm doing a, a, a podcast because people don't understand them. But basically, to understand carboxylation... You can just think of it as carbonation. Like it, it's basically just like how the body has to carbonate, <laughs> just like, you know, carbonated soda. The body has to carbonate proteins in order for those proteins to be able to bind and uh, manage calcium properly. Um, that's what carboxylation is. And so without vitamin K, we can't actually do that. This is very interesting, too, that these nutrients have these relationships because in plants that contain vitamin K, they will also often have calcium sequestering acids like oxalic acid um, that uh, help to protect the vitamin K in the plant from reacting with the calcium because vitamin K does react with calcium so readily. So high vitamin K foods like spinach or kale they'll contain oxalic acid. And if you eat them, they kind of leave kind of that little like gritty, uh, like chalky um, texture in your on your teeth. Um, and that's because your teeth are also high in calcium. And um, uh, but and 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 so the, the oxalic acid actually separate and then also because a lot of those uh, leafy greens um, actually do contain high amounts of calcium. Uh, anyway, um, the the things like oxalic acid help to separate the calcium from destroying the vitamin K that's in the plant, um, and, um, and and that's just interesting because uh, it's that's that that's that's the nature of like vitamin K. Vitamin K helps our body utilize calcium and reacts with calcium and is used by the body to carboxylate proteins that react with calcium. And so it basically like. Um, all calcium metabolism in the body is highly dependent on vitamin K. And that's ultimately like why it's so important. Specifically pathways that are affected by that, the number one most commonly uh, recognized uh, function of these vitamin K dependent proteins is in coagulation. So if you get cut and you start to bleed and then it um, stops and heals over, a l that, that whole function is all based on uh, vitamin K and um, vit these vitamin K dependent um, proteins and pathways called prothrombin thromb thrombin and thrombin. Um, and um, and if you've ever heard of like deep vein thrombosis and like, you know, and, and people who get um, stroke, like when you have a stroke, uh, strokes are caused by a clot in like your in your in your blood veins and arteries in your brain. Um, an embolism is, is elsewhere too. And the, like all of these problems are all related to, um, dysfunction of coagulation, um, pathways. 
And a lot of people also think of like prothrombin and thrombin as being um, pro-coagulation, but they also, they regulate coagulation. So they can also stop coagulation um, when it's not happening in the appropriate spot. Um, I was actually doing some research on parasites the other day uh, for my book update, which I swear is coming. And um, the the it was a study on the malaria um, uh, uh, uh uh, parasite pl plasmodium. Um, I forget the, the actual sp um, species, uh, but the plasmodium parasites are what cause malaria. And um, one of the ways that malaria causes disease is by inducing um, platelet aggregation, um, of w of which are red blood cells. Um, they 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 stick to each other. That's what coagulation is, and that thrombin proteins actually inhibited inappropriate coagulation triggered by plasmodium. So it kind of suggests, I didn't really do much research into this yet, but it kind of suggests that like a vitamin K deficiency would make you more susceptible to the um, harmful effects if you got malaria, for instance, although that's not really a common problem in a lot of, a lot of places, some places still, but not too many, too many. Um, so that's kind of like a demonstration of what vitamin K does. And then um, vitamin K also um, uh, is necessary. And there's, this, okay, so like another important like function of calcium is in sex hormone synthesis. And in especially in men, um, testicles are highly dependent on calcium metabolism. And if you uh, uh, don't have good um, calcium intake or you have low vitamin K, your testicles actually can't produce um, uh, testosterone very well. And so one of the problems that underlie conditions like hypogonadism is directly related to vitamin K deficiency um, because people are not getting enough vitamin K. And Ray's, you know, Ray, um, vitamin K is one of the nutrients that Ray's work talked about all the time. Like it just so, so important because of all of these certain pathways. Also, for instance, like the nervous system and the brain are highly affected by calcification issues. And as you age and you get... Um, you start getting metabolic disease, calcium, excess calcium influx into cells, uh, and the calcification of connective tissue and the nervous system all cause neurodegeneration and neurological disease and, and, um, and arthritis and other things. Although I, 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 that's also being a bit reductive because um, a lot of those essentially also involve um, pathogens underlying those as well, which um, vitamin K can't uh, uh, does have some role in helping the immune system, but it's not like antimicrobial itself. Um, and but but the, the, so those are all like like um, vitamin K deficiency affects like every system in the body, basically. Um, so and and so Ray's work, you know, he Ray talked uh, a great deal about vitamin K. Uh, vitamin K appeared in a lot of his writings. Um, and um, yeah. And so, so a lot of people that like follow his work have like, uh, you know, already know this, like, I'm not really, I'm kind of preaching to the choir for people that already follow my work, my work. But the big difference that comes in here is a problem that I confront every time that I'm coaching people and helping them is this misunderstanding that vitamin K can come from supplements. And this is one of the problems that I've found coming from Ray's work is that Ray didn't specifically advocate that you should only use supplements and not get it from diet. But a lot of the ways that he talks about plants and the microbiome um, infers or implies or leads people to uh, decide to not eat their vegetables. <laughs> and I can see why this became really appealing when it first this kind of problem first started, because a lot of people who are in health um, uh, and wellness circles are here because we have bad health. Like we've gotten here because our health has gotten bad for some reason and we don't really know. And we keep trying and doing everything that mainstream um, uh, lay person um, met, uh, nutritional advice recommends uh, like dieting and exercise and avoiding sugar and avoiding fats and none of it works. You still continue having health problems and you become frustrated. So you get online and you start investigating forums and other places where you can like go in and, you know, learn new things and try to figure out what the fuck is wrong with you. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, myself, I come to find out, um, you know, uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago 
that um, essentially my health problems for the last, um, I mean, they started really in like 2011. So what is that? 13 years has been, but even, and, but even more than that, like I, I, you know, I, I had, I had um, minor health issues when I was a child have all come because are caused by cystic fibrosis. So like, you know, there really was something very wrong with me from the very beginning. Um, and, um, but I, you know, no doctors ever diagnosed me with it. So I never got any help with it. Um, and even when I was literally dying and almost dead, doctors still would tell me like I went into, um, I might have told this last stream, so sorry if I did, but um, I, I went into the doctor's, I went into an emergency room um, because I had been coughing like crazy and it wouldn't stop. Like I was literally coughing every like 10, 15 minutes and it was, it wasn't like really phlegmy. It was like a dry cough and it was, but it was consistent and it was keeping me up. I, I already had insomnia. Um, but, but the, it just seemed really, really alarming. And I went into the emergency room and they x-rayed my chest and they told me I was fine. And do I want some steroids? And I was like, okay, sure. And so they gave me some steroids. They didn't help at all. I kept getting worse. And then that's when I found out I had tumors on my thyroid. Um, and then, and that's when I found Ray Pete. And then I started um, incorporating a lot of his advice and get, and then I got better. I got, I started improving like right away. Um, which is, you know, the, the, this, this whole story is what I talk about in my book. So, and now if you're listening and you don't have a copy of my book, get one, um, help support the stream. Hi, Gregory. Welcome. Um, and, um, there's a lot of stuff in it. I mean, I can't even begin to cover what my book covers, um, uh, in, in streams, but I, you know, I try to. So anyway, um, so like, you know, I, I, you know, I got, I got to this place too, from having my health completely crash. And, um, you know, mainstream, um, and, and n nobody, I mean the one, like I, you know, I went, I went to doctor after doctor, I went to a, probably a total of six, maybe seven before I found one doctor who was like, oh, Hey, maybe we should, you know, image your thyroid. Um, hi Gabriel. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. So, um, and she, uh, she, she, she like, uh, cause all the, I kept going to like, uh, this doctor didn't help me. Like they, I went and told them my symptoms. They did tests said there was nothing wrong with me except that oh your white blood cells are elevated but there's nothing else wrong with you and like okay then why then why is that like fucking check it out <laughs> they but they wouldn't and so then i would go to the next doctor and then i would go to another one and then i would go to another one and then i finally went to one who was like oh let's image your thyroid and i was like okay sure let's do that and then there were five tumors on my thyroid and so like jesus christ so um so um, so then I found repeat stuff and, um, and yeah. And so one of the major, you know, one of the major hallmarks of his work was like real, a lot of emphasis on vitamin K, but a lot of where I think Ray's work is not helpful is a lot of his solution. Like a lot of people, um, think that these, uh, the solution to these kinds of deficiencies can be fixed in supplementation. And the more that I keep doing this work, the less supplementation plays a role in my wellness. And, and, um, and I mean, you know, like, I mean, compared, especially compared to when I was, um, 32, 33, I'm 43 now, or I'm not, I keep, I guess I'm so excited to get old. I'm still a few months away from 43, <laughs> but, um, uh, I have more hair now than I did then. I, you know, my libido is amazing. Um, and it wasn't back then. Um, I had depression, suicidal depression back then and alcoholism and I no longer have it. So like, um, you know, um, um, you know, and, 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 and while supplementation has helped at times, the more knowledge I accumulate, the more discoveries I make and the more research that I do, the less, that supplementation is a, uh, a very viable alternative to the actual food source. Um, and, you know, and when you talk about um, nutrients that are so important for the human body, like vitamin K or vitamin E, um, you know, we haven't had supplements available for our health and wellness, except for in the last, like, maybe 75 years of human history of the thousands of years of human history that we've had right and vitamin k is available all around us it's in every leafy green food that you 
can find at the store or even in the wild. <laughs> um, hell, I was walking like so the other one day, like, well, actually, it, it was quite a while ago now, but I was going for a walk in this wilderness area. And I just happened to stop and talk to some random lady and she was telling me, uh, well, actually a sad story about her daughter passing away from skin cancer. But then she told me that like, oh, all of this growing around us is wild mustard. You can have some. It's really delicious. And I was like, what? So I like reached down and it's like this little green plant with little purple flowers and I ate some and oh my God, it was delicious. It was really yummy. It was like it was like sweet, you know, like a like a mustard like a mustard dressing on like a salad, like is really good, and it's but it's kind of sweet. It tasted like that. It was really delicious. They were very light, um, and they weren't really heavily mustardy tasting. It was just kind of like mild and mustard flavor in, in plants is uh, is sulfur. It's dietary sulfur, which is also really good for you and necessary. Um, but anyway, so so a lot of people. Um, and then, and then, and and the you know the subtitle title on my you know this stream is that uh you know carnivore diet is this uh, really popular fad that a lot of people do. I think it's on its way out right now, um, but the carnivore diet is like a version of the Atkins diet, which was really popular when I was a kid. Um, my parents and um, my aunts and uncles were all doing Atkins or tried it, and it was you know I think Oprah promoted at once and uh, um and and then they were all getting they all they all lost you know everyone's everyone's um everyone's health goals are always just to get skinny it's so fucking stupid and so they they're like they'll like lose like 10 oh i lost like 10 pounds on this diet oh my god and then you know and then another another few months later they're like having insomnia and and their body hurts and <laughs> they're having all these other health problems and um which, which, by the way, you know, if you're here because you want to get skinny, like, yeah, it's normal. Like, we all want to be accepted. Like, I, you know, I totally get it. Um, but there are there are a lot there there are a lot more important aspects to being healthy than just being lean. And um, you know, and I was telling somebody about this the other day, like uh, that I was coaching. Like, um, I never really understood when I was younger in my twenties that I had an eating disorder. Um, I thought the dieting and exercise I was doing was what you're, it was healthy. Like you're supposed to like starve yourself, you know, but, and because I was, you know, because I was under eating in the name of dieting and exercise, um, it didn't even strike me that it was actually anorexia. I mean, it was, you know, it's, it was a, you know, I had full on body dysmorphia and was starving myself because I was so desperate to be liked by people and be accepted. Right. And I had been conditioned by my childhood to believe that my uh, physical appearance was the most important aspect in um, self worth and self value. Um, and it's not true. It can it couldn't be further from the truth. There are so many other aspects to yourself as a person, what you can offer to the world and the quality of your own life that has nothing to do with how big your waist is. Um, and, um, you know, and, and if, and if you have fears about your appearance and your, and your self-worth based on how you look, um, that's a very common uh, effective trauma that a lot of people have. Um, and, um, but it, it, it is a lot more productive to come to terms with that and accept that mortality is very limited and that we don't control biology and, um, that people that only like you because you're skinny aren't people that you really want to be around anyway. Right. Um, myself, I would rather be alone than around people who are like, like one of my siblings, I don't have, you know, a lot of, you know, that I don't really have relationships with my family because there are a lot of conservative bigots. Um, uh, but like one of my sisters that I would, every time I would see her when I was like, so when I was good looking, <laughs> she would, and I was around, she'd, she'd make comments like, Oh my gosh, you're so handsome. And Oh my gosh. And blah, blah, blah. Then when I was fat and older, she like would make comments like you should come to yoga with me. And she would say it like all the time, like just all the time. And I'm like, you know, and I, I'm telling her like, I'm not doing yoga I'm doing research on like health stuff and like <laughs> I, I nearly just died of cancer. Like I'm not, I don't have energy to go do yoga. <laughs> it was fucking nuts. Uh, anyway. Uh, and, and people like that, know, you know, have their own trauma. They have, it, this ties into like a chapter that I wrote in my book called, um, uh, what is that title of that chapter? Um, sex appeal comes from diet, not genetics. Um, 
the reason that we are drawn to people who look sexy or act sexy too. There, you know, people can act sexy too. There are some guys that have voices that just like, oh my god, they just send me, you know, oh, and um, uh, <laughs> and people with energy, you know, they're like a lot of people who are like successful streamers, you know, like um, like uh, content producers and stuff. The ones that aren't like hamming it up and trying too hard, um get a lot of uh, uh, success because of their energy levels. They're just, they're just, there's so much energy coming out of them that they're just exploding on screen and, and people love it and, you know, and are drawn to that kind of stuff. And so it's not just like, it's not just the fact that you might be like pretty or like fit. It's that you're healthy and not the, just that you're like physically healthy, you're energetically healthy and you're emotionally healthy. Um, we as human beings are drawn to those aspects in other human beings because that kind of health and wellness indicates access to resources that we ourselves might not have access to and it's not at all a function of genetics genetics being this physiological ideal that so often is invoked in health circles and in medicine too is a um authoritarian byproduct of the last several thousand years of uh, the religious desecration of the human body and medicine. When um, medicine for a very long time has always blamed people for their diseases. Um, and genetics is just an extension of that. When, hum when, we, when science started discovering what genes were and how they were involved in health and, and biology, um, they just transferred the same ideas that already existed in medicine through new lingo. So instead of using the terms genetics, because we didn't have that term before, they used heredity, hereditary, uh, the mother, their, the mom's mother's constitution. They're all of these buzzwords. They, they said the same exact thing. They just didn't use the word genetics because then genetics has just been, um, was, is, was a more useful tool for blaming people for their disease that the medical profession was already doing, which is already also biased and prejudiced from religion because, you know, most of our human history for the last several thousand years has been based on religion. People uh, didn't understand psychological illness and mental illness and physical malady and plagues. And so they would blame spiritual, you know, um, divine um, supernatural forces on that kind of stuff, you know, and some of the most laughably absurd stuff too, like vapors. And <laughs> I mean, and it's really funny too, because, you know, most people nowadays don't understand too, that like legends like vampires and werewolves come from people not understanding biology. Like the whole concept of a vampire comes because when you exhumed dead people, which ha did happen to, um, they would be only partly decomposed like they would uh, their the lips would dehydrate and sink and shrink back and um um the body wouldn't really decay because it would be buried you know in a in a in a in a clean space underground wrapped in clo in, in material and you know devoid of oxygen like you don't have any oxygen down there for microbes to promote um um to promote a uh, decay and also when you bury people very deeply in the ground too you bury them way below the microbi microbiological level um their bodies don't de decompose and then the lips um drying up would um, contract backward and expose the teeth more and make them look really frightening and then people's superstition and then also um tuberculosis was rampant and that makes you cough up blood and you know the, like if you've ever seen bram stoker's dracula which is like um um by Francis Ford Coppola. It's one of my favorite movies. It's so much fun. Um, but uh, like you can see all of this hype uh, superstition um, happening in um, in that film. Um, how like you can see easily how these um, these phenomena of biology and medicine like l um, that we were ignorant to before led to inform those kinds of beliefs. Um, and superstitions and anyway and and so the same thing like so when you like when when people talk about how like you know sexual attraction is because someone has good genes it has absolutely nothing to do with that um genes 
are not sources of food themselves. They are not sources of nutrients. You, they genes, it doesn't matter what genes you have if you don't have access to the nutrients that your body relies on to actually run and build itself. And, um, and so when we have sexual attraction to other people or not even, and I keep saying sexual, but I don't mean that. I mean, attraction, like people who are not sexually attracted to each other can still be, uh, allured and drawn toward people who are healthy and energetic. And one of the reasons they do is because of our biological instinct to associate with people who are healthy, because that would put us in proximity to resources, both nutritional and behavioral because eating is as much a behavior as it is a, um, you know, an actual, like the actual food that we're talking about. Um, it's a survival instinct to get us to be around, um, people that might have access to resources that we don't have. And, um, consequently that also brings attention and validation to people. People are like, Oh, other people like me, you know, and we all want that. We all want to be, we all want to be viewed as, desirable and wanted. But um, those kinds of instinctual um, coping behaviors are amplified when you have ample trauma and metabolic stress. And so just just wanting to be skinny to get that kind of validation can really work against your efforts to get that because you end up doing things that are more harmful to your body and cause more disease like I was doing when I was in my 20s, starving myself, working out too hard, and um, ended up, and even though I already had cystic fibrosis, one of the reasons that I got so ill, so like I basically got all the diseases that a person without cystic fibrosis would have gotten in their 50s. I got it in my 30s because I had cystic fibrosis. So, but um, so I, it was one of the things too, like, you know, I was a big alcoholic and I, I, I went into AA, got sober and I remember thinking like, yeah, there, there were a lot of like a lot of people in there who were younger, but mostly in AA and recovery programs, most of the people in those programs are older. They're in their forties, fifties and sixties. And I remember just wondering like, why did my health, like so many other young people get to drink and party for years until they're literally in their fifties and sixties before they start having health problems. And I like, all I did was drink and I, um, and I smoked pot occasionally and I got like really bad health, um, side effects from it in my thirties. And it was cause I had cystic fibrosis, but anyway, I digress. So, um, so Behaviors like foods like vitamin K are um, 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 uh, the nutrients that actually give us those things that we want for our health, um, which uh, most people refer to as being skinny or fit or whatever. Um, what they really mean by that is healthy and real health comes especially from the fat soluble nutrients. Um, one of the big um, biologists that uh, 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 that, uh, whose work that I also reference and use was, is Weston A. Price. Weston A. Price was a big, um, uh, he was a dentist, um, in like the early 1900s. And he was really famous because he did a world survey of indigenous cultures before and after the introduction of industrial food systems. So he would go and he would survey, photograph and document tribes and people who were eating traditional diets and then other tribes and people that had converted over into eating refined flour and, and refined sugar and, and that kind of stuff. And he found that the um, people who had, you know, and this actually, this actually also ha plays a, a big role in like racism. Um, and it's actually important to talk about too. So a, um, a lot of times when you see photographs or, um, uh, you know, documentation of indigenous peoples they often have messed up teeth and you know smaller jaws and aren't what you would describe as like healthy and that is not reflective of indigenous culture that is actually the effects of receiving industrial foods that become that then replace what people were eating normally because industrial foods are cheaper and indigenous people are often economically disenfranchised from their colonial, kind of colonializing, you know, um, Europeans that came in and took over the places that they lived and decimated their systems, um, can't afford like the good food anymore. So they, they rely then on, um, you know, like 
just bread and other things that don't have a lot of fat soluble nutrients in them. And the fat soluble nutrients like Weston A. Price's work um, demonstrated are um, like the most important for developmental morphology, like in dentition and the shape of your jaws and the placement of your teeth and stuff like that. So the photographs that he took of indigenous um, peoples that were still eating their traditional diets they look like they have daily access to a dentist. They have the most amazing smiles and, and perfectly aligned teeth, and they don't have any dental care. And the reason for that is because they were eating foods that have vitamin K and carotene and all the fat soluble nutrients that we don't get from industrialized systems. Um, so when you talk about like vitamin K and other nutrients like that, and then but then you talk about them only in terms of supplementation, there's such a disconnect there between how our physiology actually works and um and 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 what and, and how disease is is being caused because nobody on planet earth has a vitamin k deficiency because they don't supplement vitamin k that's just not how things work we have been eating vitamin k foods since we before we were even a human species and the entire millions of years that we have been a human species vitamin k foods have been a staple in every human diet um some of the earliest ones that you find in um anthropological sites are like lilies and i don't even know what that means because i've never eaten a lily in my life <laughs> like I don't know what they mean when they say that, but they're the, but they did. Our ancestors ate lilies, like literally ate lilies as like a food source and like things like tiger nuts, which are the tuber that grows under, um, uh, 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 what are they called? What is the type of, I can't remember what the plant is that a tiger nut comes from. Um, sedges, there it is. Sedges, um, sedges are like a kind of grassy kind of plant um and 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 water chestnuts and um and tiger nuts are the, the tuber root and we used and we would eat those and if you also haven't had a tiger nut holy crap they look and taste like sugar smack cereal like they're rougher obviously they're they're not as soft because sugar smacks is just like puffed rice or something like that but they're so sweet i could not believe how sweet they were like sure, like a, a tiger nut is a, is a food that lots of animals eat around the world because um, it's just like it's just a it's just a like a, a little uh, fleshy tuber that grows under a sedge in in swampy environments. So moose eat them, and 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 monkeys, and and well, not my, maybe not monkeys, but probably like primates, and and we used to eat them too as human beings, and it's one of the reasons why we had such huge jaws because they're kind of tough to chew actually. Um, but horchata, horchata. The drink horchata is originally a drink made from tiger nuts. It's not rice. Rice is the more um, rice is the more Western, um, ver cheaper version of horchata. Horchata was originally made of of tiger nuts because it's so sweet. It literally tastes like breakfast cereal. It's they're really yummy. Um, but anyway, they, but they don't have vitamin K. So I, I, dig I digress. But like um, so anyway, um, and um. The whole carnivore diet, like it, it just, I mean, I understand why people think it's logical, but it's not at all logical. Like not, it's not even close to think that our ancestors subsisted only on meat is so dumb. Like, like, do you know how hard hunting is with a spear and a bow and arrow? Like we have all of these people today who think that they're hunters and then they have these like high powered rifles, you know, that can kill like a bull elephant really easily like that is not the kind of hunting that our ancestors did our ancestors threw spears at animals you cannot do that every day <laughs> you th and the entire reason that agriculture exists in the first place is because we were already eating plants lots of them and we started cultivating them and growing them ourselves as a intelligent animal species and that's why agriculture even exists we didn't just invent agriculture we were already eating those foods and plants and we kept and then we kept cult and we started cultivating them and then we started amassing more and more variety and so this idea that vitamin k like the foods that plant foods don't play a role in our diet is so devoid of any logic in terms of how we evolved as a species. Um, and then, but then you also look at the effects of those kinds of diets on human beings. Um, they're really catastrophic. They produce really intense um, health effects. 
in carnivore circles, it's very common for people to be telling everyone else that's doing it to just push through the pain. That's so fucking stupid. The reason that you're in pain is because your body is telling you that you're hurting it. If you like, you know, put a knife in your wrist, the pain that you feel is your body telling you not to keep doing that. It's the same thing when you starve yourself or you have really bad diets and your health starts to go down the toilet is because it's not right for your body. Like it, it doesn't work that way. Like that's just not how any of this works. Um, so one of the reasons that you have that problem um, in terms of vitamin K when you get a vitamin K deficiency is not just the effects that the vitamin K deficiency has on our physiology. It also is some of the effects that it has on our microbiome. And this is where we get into the real problem with like vitamin K issues and ideology and dietary ideology is that vitamin as, as important as vitamin K is for our physiology, it's even more important for our commensal microbiome. Now, other people in adjacent health circles and including repeat too, which is, and this is something that I disagree with him on, is that um, the microbiome is not that important. And to that, I say an entire section of our intestinal system, its entire function, the, the large intestine is nothing but to cultivate the microbiome. The entire reason that we have a large intestine is for our commensal microbiome. We would not have a separate organ like that if the microbiome was not important. And a lot of the information for this kind of um, viewpoint comes from certain studies, especially done on mice and rodents in clinical laboratory settings where they show alleviation or resolution in certain metabolic conditions by eliminating the um, microbiome entirely of those animals, for instance, like so, um, uh, and giving them like a sterile gut. And this is also one of the same problems that leads to uh, harmful dietary behaviors like fasting and starving and dieting yourself because there is legitimacy to a lot of those points. Um, the way in which a lot of health problems are caused are by opportunistic pathogenic microorganisms that colonize our gut. And so if you deprive them of food or you use antibiotics to wipe them out, you then wipe out the health problems that they're causing, right? So then the next leap of logic is like, oh, I should do that all the time. But guess what? That doesn't work, actually. That's not how it works. Um, yes, it can be good to use antibiotics when you have disease. But the problem is, is that a lot of the nutrients that we rely on are also made by our microbiome. So for instance, um, if you take like, let's say a healthy rat and it has enough food and then you wipe out its microbiome or you inoculate it with some disease causing organism and wipe it out, then it might show improvement. But guess what? It's had a healthy microbiome for a while. And that microbiome has been producing very important nutrients that an animal like that needs. For instance, vitamin B12 or the short chain fatty acids. One of the short chain fatty acids is called acetic acid which is the constituent of vinegar. And acetic acid is a necessary cofactor in so many metabolic pathways. Um, some of you have probably heard of the, um, the, the whole methylation, overmethylation and undermethylation, um, MHTR, MHFRT, I can't remember the acronym. <laughs> Can you guys help me out? What is that one? M M M H F R T M M F H T R. Methyl uh trans something folate <laughs> i can't remember that, one, that one. it's the methylation pathway that a lot of people there's this whole like um a, a branch of of online health people that that fixate on methylation issues um methylation pathways in the body turn off genes as needed and a lot of people don't understand this either like our, our genes are not always active your body turns on and turns off genes as needed and methylation is how genes are turned off. And acetylation is how they're turned on. And I'm also, this is reductionist and oversimplistic, but basically this is how it works. So basically, if you don't have enough acetic acid production in your gut, 
your genes can get turned off, but they can't get turned back on. <laughs> and this is actually one of the fundamental problems of aging and metabolic illness is that as your gut microbiome becomes colonized by opportunistic microorganisms, you produce less acetic acid. And then with less acetic acid, your literal genetics don't work as well because you don't, you're don't you not producing enough uh, acetate in your gut. And we can't produce acetate as a human being. Um, uh, uh, um, um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that, then that's the problem. And so, and, and because of that, we rely on our commensal microbiome. Now you can always supplement. So, um, acetate and, um, and one of the things that I've done in my work is popularize, um, the use of sodium acetate, um, Sodium acetate and, uh, you know, and people that have never heard of me take sodium acetate now because of how effective it is in, in a lot of health stuff. But one of the, like you can supplement, you can use any time that you like have a vinaigrette, you know, on a salad or you, if you're one of those people that supplement vinegar, I, I can't stand doing that though. It tastes so bad to me. Um, you can supplement acetic acid and it has, it has a lot of health benefits. Um, um, you know, I, I, um, I discovered the cure for alcoholism and addiction, which is directly related to acetic acid um, availability in the gut. Um, and I, I explained that in a separate video stream and in my book, and there's an article on my website too that you can go check that out if that's relevant for you. But um, that shows like a deficiency in acetic acid contributes to alcoholism and addiction. That's how important acetic acid is for us. So if you don't have a good microbiome producing acetic acid, you get metabolic diseases and a lot of them too. And that's just one of the set of the short chain fatty acids. Um, the others are propionic acid and butyric acid and um, is succinic acid the other one? And I don't know if that is a short chain fatty acid or not. There's And there's others. Um, and uh, the, those are the big ones though, propionic, acetic, and butyric. And um, our gut, the colonocytes of the gut, the cells that line the colon, those run on butyric acid, for instance. And so if you don't have a gut microbiome making butyric acid, then you don't have healthy colonocytes. So wiping out your gut microbiome with antibiotics is antithesis to how the intestinal system works. The intestinal system and thus our entire body is dependent on our microbiome to produce nutrients that we have evolved to um we have evolved on and evolved to coexist with that microbiome. So wiping them out is like just not a good idea. Um, and, and that's also why, you know, and, and the other part too, a lot of these studies that show like um, some health benefits from like a sterile gut and like rodents. That's also in like a clinical laboratory setting where they're able to actually keep out all the other microbes that might colonize those animals. <laughs> there are a lot of other pathogens that um, our only line of defense against them is our commensal microbiome. One of the most problematic is Clostridioides difficile. And you might have heard of it because it's a really dangerous gut pathogen. Hundreds of thousands of people are killed by it every year. Uh, elderly, 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 oh my Jesus Christ. <laughs> elderly and immunocompromised people um, um, uh, very frequently die from um, infection with Clostridioides difficile, especially when they're in hospital settings on antibiotics because the antibiotics wipe out your commensal microbiome that protects us from those kinds of pathogens. So if you are taking antibiotics all the time as a prophylactic to metabolic disease, you actually make yourself more susceptible to long-term health disease, uh, health problems by, um, by causing um, deficiencies in the microbiome produced nutrients like short chain fatty acids and B vitamins. Um, and, um, and, and it's just not possible to stay well for a long period of time when you're doing that. So, okay. So why was I talking about the gut microbiome though, in relation to vitamin K, um, the, uh, the vitamin K as important, like I said earlier, as important for our body as it is, is more important for our commensal microbiome. And you cannot get around that requirement. And there's a lot of very specific reasons and causes and, and health symptoms that are caused by this problem that I'll get into now. So, um, uh, our commensal microbiome sometimes seems like it's really hard to fix. 
<laughs> you might be one of those people that's taken tons of probiotics and you know done all this shit to try to fix your microbiome. And the reason that it hasn't worked for you is because the people that are selling you those products don't actually care if your microbiome works. They're trying to use the fact that you're sick to sell you a product. And you don't understand that. And that's why you've put so much money and effort and time into this and haven't gotten anything out of it is because the things that you're purchasing and doing don't actually do what they're saying they do. <laughs> and what do what doesn't help is that there is a lot of scientific studies behind certain things like probiotics that support and rationalize the use of those, but are not applicable in, in any or in every or most situations of metabolic disease because absence of those microbes is not the problem. If you wipe out the gut of a mouse and then you put in like lac lactobacillus longum or something in there, yeah, it's gonna get it's gonna get better, right? Um, but that probiotic isn't gonna do anything about Clostridioides difficile infection. And if you have um, opportunistic microbes colonizing your gut like that, um, those kinds of products and things are not going to solve that. And all, also, actually, I just realized a deficit in my explanations for this. If you're thinking that antibiotics will wipe out um, Clostridioides difficile, it is one of the hardest pathogens to eradicate with antibiotics. Usually requires like a three regimen combination of sort of antibiotics when you have it, and the 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 the, the um. The infection can get so bad that it actually migrates up into your gallbladder and liver, and that's how it kills you. And so, so, and 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 and, and uh, often requires a fecal microbiome transplant. Um, and and okay, so and I've worked with people that have had fecal microbiome transplants, and they don't last. Why don't they last? This is a really common problem um, uh, that's that's known in the medical field with fecal microbiome transplants is that they can work and they can work for a time, but very often they actually don't work long term. Now, why is that? It's not because you're missing those microbes. It's because the environment in which those microbes are growing is not conducive to their survival. Part of that problem is that they are missing actually nutrients from the diet, but you don't understand that because you don't understand what food does and the role that it plays in those kinds of functions of the human body and microbiome. So our commensal microbiome actually is very good at fighting with opportunistic pathogens. It is. It doesn't seem that way from your experience because they've never had the right environment to actually succeed. One of those nutrient requirements is vitamin K. Um, and one of the problems when you're thinking about this issue and trying to solve it in your own life is that having like a salad, like let's say you have like a really big like arugula salad and uh, or is arugula very high in vitamin K? I think it's like marginally. Let's say you have like a, a spinach, baby spinach salad. That's like one of the highest vitamin K sources you can possibly have. So let's say you have like this like baby spinach salad and it's really good and you eat a shit ton of it. And then the next day you're like, oh my God, I had that huge salad, baby spinach salad. There must be enough vitamin K in there to last me for like a week. Like I don't need to have another one today. That's not how any of this works. You can think of the microbiome every time you eat because like, like, you know, I, I kind of like draw a parallel to like making bread or like making um, kombucha or um, anything else that's fermented, beer and wine. <laughs> you can think of the fact, like every time that you're eating a meal, you can think of it as like making a batch of bread or beer or wine. If all the right ingredients are not in every single meal that you eat, you're going to get a different result every single time that you eat. So for instance, if someone's making beer and you know, what does beer have like hops and barley and stuff? like that, but they decide to throw in a chicken breast in there, right? <laughs> What's that going to do to the beer, right? Um, one of the problems that we encounter when we have metabolic disease and gut dysbiosis is that you're colonized by opportunistic microbes and your commensal microbiome can be very good at overcoming them, but your diet is actually more feeding more the proteolytic opportunistic pathogens than it is the ones that are commensal because our commensal microbiome need um, vitamin K, vitamin D, and sugar, but you're eating 
like a shit ton of protein and Coke and, uh, you know, and, 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 um, and, uh, refined flour and stuff like that. And there, so there's like no phytonutrients that in, 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 in most people's diets that would actually inhibit the pathogens, nor also those that would feed and promote our commensal microbiome. So like, when you're consider when you're thinking about vitamin K in your diet, it's not that you have a giant meal of vitamin K to feed those microbiome. It's that vitamin K is actually more effective if it's omnipresent in your diet to promote your commensal microbiome every time that there is an introduction of nutrient substrate into that environment. Um. So a a, a more specific explanation of like why this is a problem is like for instance have any of you heard of amines do you know what amines are amines are like one of the most common one that everyone has heard of is histamine um when people are talking about this they, they usually say biogenic amines and i don't know what the fuck that means because all like things are biogenic like i just i don't understand why people use those terms um all all all, all nutrients are bio yeah i mean just i don't know um biogenic amines are derivatives of um amino acids and histamine is a really common one that most people have heard of because histamine um induces uh you know the symptoms of an allergic reaction it mediates uh your body's response to allergens um so histamine as a demonstration to what amines do to our body is really easy for people to understand amines are more powerful analogs of their amino acid equivalent and amino acids themselves are also extremely influential on our body not one single amino acid is benign in or benign is not probably the right word um uh inactive um in the body uh any amino acid that you take in your body has direct physiological effects on your body. Um, amino acids are how our body does things. And um, amines are more powerful versions of their amino acid um, counterparts. So um, histamine is a very consequential um, uh, consequence of certain bacteria being in your body that cause metabolic disease and the symptoms that you have in, from gut dysbiosis. Um, one of the most harmful ones that I talk about a more with, with increasing frequency in, in my work now is tyramine, uh, which is made from the amino acid tyrosine, which is the precursor to dopamine and adrenaline. Also, oh wait, and I've got to look this one up because I can't remember how to pronounce it. Um, amine of... <laughs> I usually try to figure out how to say these words, but this one I've not, uh, uh, wait, where is it? It didn't come up on the first search. Biogenic amine. <laughs> where is it? Oh, well, oh, well. Oh, there it is. Um, phenylethylamine. Phenyl and phenylethylamine and tyramine are basically like adrenaline analogs that are even stronger adrenaline stimulants than adrenaline is. Um, they're very actually quite harmful for the body. The body uses them, and the body our body makes amines, right? Our body also makes histamine, but uh, uh, uh. Sorry, my brain got sidetracked real quick. Um, a train drove by, and I love the trains. <laughs> um, uh, 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 our body makes amines, but when microbes make amines in our gut, they make excess, and so that disturbs the pathways that they um, that they function in. And um, microorganisms of spoilage are very much the same ones that cause um, gut disease. Like the same reason that you have like um, uh, meat, that meat goes bad on like a store shelf and the, and the reason that they put like preservatives in it, you know, when meat goes really bad, moldy and smelly. Those are the same microbes that are eating you, that are causing your metabolic disease and that have colonized your gut. They're, they're doing the same thing. They're trying to eat your body. Like that, that's fundamentally what the problem that's going on when you have metabolic illness. Um, it's the same thing. Um, and, 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 and consequently, a lot of the preservatives that are used to preserve food can actually also have health benefits, although some of them are also very harmful because it, it depends on whether or not they're actually like 
harmful to microbes or harmful to everything. <laughs> um, uh, like for instance, like vitamin C and citric acid are like really common food preservatives because um, they inhibit a lot of those microorganisms of spoilage and they are also very healthy for us. And our body even makes citric acid endogenously from dietary carbohydrate, uh, which again is another reason why like the carnivore diet is fucking insane because you need to have enough carbohydrate in your body to make citric acid for your body to live. <laughs> and if you're only getting citric acid, this tiny amount of citric acid that's in animal meat, um, you're not getting enough. And that's one of the reasons like nutrients like vitamin K, especially and citric acid are one of the reasons why people with, that do carnivore diets get that really weird looking skin, like their skin starts to look like they're not breathing, like they're just constantly like suffocating and starved. Um, it's because like those nutrients are so important for like decalcification of the skin and cellular respiration. So like the organs are literally like dying and suffocating, like, um, but anyway, so, um, uh, uh, let me, let me pose this, um, like scenario to you. So, you can take like, say like a head of lettuce or a slab of steak and leave them out on the counter. Which one is gonna last longer? The, you know, hands down like lettuce. I mean, I actually get surprised by how long, I mean, it'll wilt, but like um, um, uh, like plants will last. Like I, I, I had an apple fall behind my, the bowl that contains my onions and apples and stuff like that. Um, and I didn't find it. It's probably been like a good month. <laughs> And it was just barely wilted, like, you know, on the outside, but like, um, you know, but a steak, you know, if you leave a steak out by within 12 hours, it's going to start smelling really revolting. Um, a lot of those, a lot of the, that kind of resistance is because of phytochemicals that are in plants and, and stuff like uh, vitamin K. And for those same reasons, they also inhibit opportunistic pathogens when you eat them too. Ray, a lot of Ray's work, he talks about certain um, parts of plants like fiber and things that can irritate the gut. And he's not wrong about any of those things. What the, the part that I find to be unhelpful is what you do with that information. information. So like when people talk about stuff like, you know, excess fiber um, causing problems in the gut, um, that's not uh, wrong at all. The way to use that information, though, is where you get problems. Um, and taking a supplement as a replacement for these nutrients, it, do, it just doesn't work. You can use it. Uh, you can use these as a supplement to increase your levels, right? Like if you, if you do have a vitamin K deficiency or vitamin E deficiency, you can totally use the supplements. But they cannot be a replacement for the food source that you have, because there are so many systems in our body that rely on food um, and food sources of those nutrients that you will, they cannot be a replacement for that. So, and so one of the primary problems with vitamin K and not eating foods that have vitamin K is that that impairs our commensal microbiome that would otherwise protect our body from the harmful pathogens, um, 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 microbes of spoilage that get into your gut and, and cause disease by producing lots of ammonia and hydrogen sulfide and, um, amines. Um, and so tyrosine, so, or, or, I mean, um, tyramine, like, so tyramine is one of the most consequential metabolites of not having vitamin K present in your gut when you eat food. So you can have a robust enough microbiome that you don't have to have vitamin K in every meal. But if you are very ill and you're struggling with your health, that means that your microbiome is also struggling. Our health begins in the gut. So if you don't have good health, you do not have a good gut microbiome and you have to support them as much as possible. So um, studies show that the presence of vitamin K inhibits microbes that produce lactic acid and amines and other harmful um, metabolites and the presence of vitamin K promotes our commensal microorganisms. And so the way to use vitamin K isn't to be like overly dogmatic and be like, oh, I'm going to be vegan now and eat everything raw <laughs> all the time either. It's that you should have vitamin K every time you're eating protein. Um, 
my, uh, pathogenic microorganisms are most commonly interested in proteins. That's one of the reasons why they are pathogenic to us is because our body is constructed of protein. <laughs> and so they try to get that protein and eat us alive for their own needs. Our commensal microbiome don't do that. They, they do need some protein, but they're not after protein primarily. They're after sugars and fiber, indigestible carbohydrate, fiber, and, um, and nutrients like vitamin K and stuff like that. And so when our stomach digests that food, it passes those on to our commensal microbiome. When you have pathogens, um, they're thriving. And so when you diet and fast and stuff like that, uh, or do something like carnivore diet or veganism, usually what you're doing is you're cutting off a nutrient. Like when you go vegan or something or fruitarian, you're cutting off the protein that is used by the um, proteolytic amine producing microbes, which then stops those symptoms. But because our body also needs protein, you end up causing really severe health problems by taking it in an extreme. And when in reality, the solution to the problem is to more biologically appropriately support the commensal microbiome that our body is so reliant on. And then you get rid of those symptoms without also causing harm to your actual body. Um, over time, the, the real benefits of fasting that have been seen for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds and thousands, not hundreds of thousands of years um, by people is be literally just because you're cutting off the protein supply to these microbes. There are unhelpful microbes that thrive on sugar, though, for sure. Um, so one of the like, so so people will like, um, for instance, oh, well, OK, so here's actually a good example. So a little while ago. Okay, so a lot of you who are familiar with my work will know that I recommend certain strategies like using pectin or foods that are high in pectin like fruit or sodium acetate or orange juice, um, you know, other sources of sugar and salt and things like that. Um, I was working with somebody who was using sodium acetate as I prescribed and they were taking it in orange juice. But every time they ha drank it, they started having like, hello, 911. Um, so they started, they would take it, um, sorry, I'll, I'll answer that in a little bit in just a sec. Um, uh, that's a very good question, I won't know, actually. Um, so when every time she took it, she started getting like really bad gut distension and bloating and gas and belching. Like it was, it was like her gut was just like fermenting beer out of this orange juice. <laughs> so I was like, you're making sodium acetate out of apple cider vinegar, aren't you? And she's like, yeah, I'm using the Bragg's unfiltered apple cider vinegar. Well, guess what? That, it's not bad for you, but that is a live culture of yeast and bacteria that you use to make. Like um, vinegar is made out of alcohol. Um, vinegar, the way we discovered vinegar as human beings was from making wine. And if wine is left to ferment for too long, it convert, it then turns into vinegar, depending on if there's acetogens in the, in the uh, acetogenic path, uh, no, sorry, not pathogens. I've been talking for too long. Acetogenic um, microbes in the ferment, it turns into vinegar. And um, apple cider, like cult we can cultivate vinegar um, purposefully by using a uh, uh, co-fermentation a symbiotic fermentation of of that substrate with yeast and acetic acid producing micro bacteria, and so she was using a live culture with uh, a huge source of sugar, which was orange juice. So basically, like so, in inside your body, which is also you know ninety eight or higher Fahrenheit, ideal for microbe growth. So she was basically like making orange juice wine in her gut every time that she was drinking, doing the sodium acetate with orange juice. So this is like, so the, the microbiome is like, is so, so relevant for our, for our health, both in disease and in getting better. And understanding that dynamic is really, really advantageous um, when you're trying to get well, because a lot of our health starts with the, most of our health starts with the microbiome. Um, and so when you're, when you're thinking about foods and what you eat, it's not just enough to think about what those nutrients do for you directly, your physiology directly, but what effect they have on your microbiome specifically. Um, I, I've, I've said recently, um, I don't know if it's in my, I think it's in my latest version of my book, that the, the, the cause and cure for cavities, although this won't work if you're very, very sick, but um, 
our body releases the amino acid proline in saliva, which cultivates and sustains. See, when you are not eating food, your microbiome is suffering. They don't have access to like carbohydrate. And but our commensal microbiome is so important for our health. Um, our body um, naturally sustains commensal microbes by secreting proline in our saliva. And that actually sustains them in between meals. And studies show that when there's adequate proline in saliva, the oral microbiome produces almost no acids. And so um, any tooth, um, and, but the problem is, is people think, oh, okay, so I'll get a source of proline. No, that's not how that works either. The proline that the body is um, secreting in saliva is mostly comes from dietary citrulline not protein, although it can come from protein, but our body interconverts citrulline into, hello word, citrulline into arginine, proline, ornithine, urea, and ammonia, and glutamine. There's a lot. There's this whole, there's this whole, there's this whole circular pathway with those, with those amino acids. And they're all, they're all regulated by the availability of citrulline. And so, and the highest dietary source of citrulline are cucurbits. Um, watermelon and cucumbers. And so tooth decay is actually caused by a cucumber deficiency, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and when I when I discovered this, and I did discover this, that no one else on the entire planet knows this. When I discovered this, I went to some of the people that I was know that I know are coaching and said, hey, how often and how much do your children eat watermelon or cucumbers? And what is their cavity load like? And sure enough, there was even my favorite one was this one woman that I know and have worked with. She said her son and she told me to actually she asked me like um, probably like a good six months to a year before. And I wasn't purposefully researching this either. I accidentally figured it out. Um, She came to me and she said, hey, my daughter has these horrible cavities and our dentist is recommending this procedure where we have to put her under and we don't want to do that. And do you know how to cure cavities? And at the time I was like, no, sorry, I don't. And she's like, I don't understand. Cause my son is like, you know, we feed them the same and he has no cavities at all. And it's really frustrating. I was like, yeah, I know it's that it is really frustrating to deal with that kind of stuff. When I came back to her, I said, Hey, use your son or daughter. Like how, like, what do they do? How, um, what's our cucumber and watermelon intake? Like, and she's like, Oh, my son loves cucumber, but my daughter hates it. <laughs> And, you know, there, there it was, there it was, it was like the anecdotal evidence that supported what I found in, in research. So, um, uh, why was I talking about that one though? But so, um, so the microbiome though is like, is so important. So when you're like, when you're researching or dealing with nutrients like vitamin K and trying to do your own research and, and reading stuff on forums and all those kinds of things, the, like there's so much context to all of it that it's really difficult to understand and get everything right. And um, you cannot neglect the effects that nutrients have on micro on the microbiome, um, positive or negative. And one of the and one of the primary benefits that you get from eating foods high in vitamin K is that they directly support our commensal microbiome in advance and advantages them over those pro um, pro um, 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 Oh my God, my brain just like has died. It's just completely died. <laughs> those pathogenic organisms that cause those health problems by doing things like producing ammonia and amines and histamine and uh, tyramine and um, hydrogen sulfide and all that, all that stuff. Um, and so in foods, and what's really funny too, what's really funny too, and also makes me really angry, is that a lot of my work is really just kind of confirming dietary traditions that we've already had. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I just get really mad because I just like could have been eating the same way I did as a child. Although actually my diet growing up wasn't good, wasn't good enough either. But like just having like some greens with whatever you're eating, like whether if it's just like some parsley like uh, in in something or some cilantro or some basil or you know you don't you don't gotta do like a big old salad and production. Like there just needs to be some vitamin K with everything that you're eating with all sources of protein specifically too when you're having metabolic disease and gut dysbiosis. It's so productive to do that. Um, uh, so many problems are caused by the production of toxic 
metabolites or, or metabolites that are toxic in excess to our body by opportunistic microbes that our commensal microbiome will suppress so long as they're given the right nutrients to do that. And then they also can't do that if you just wipe out, wipe them out all the time either. Right. Um, so, um, so yeah. So yeah. So 911, you asked, do we need vitamin K with casein protein shakes? So that's a very good question because casein is one of the rare, it's not an exception, but it's one of the rare um, because so like the purpose of casein in mammalian milk is to inhibit opportunistic pathogens. Casein contains actually like active immunological factors like lactoferrin um, that inhibit pathogenic microbes, not really strongly, but enough that you can. And actually, so that so 911, like that was one of the reasons why casein helped me to recover from cancer so many years ago was because using it helped to um, my body digest and get protein by inhibiting the proteolytic opportunistic pathogens that were normally stealing most of my protein to make into things like amines that were not only depriving me of the amino acids that those were made from, but also the, uh, and, and also resolving the effects of, I don't even know what I just said, <laughs> that were resolving me of the effects that those um, uh, toxic amines were uh, having on my body. So using the casein was actually kind of like a substitute for having vitamin K, but you still, it still would be more profitable to have some vitamin K, yes, with like um, casein. So, but then the problem too is you do run into very real um, problems with some like vegetables and sources of vitamin K. Like phytic acid is a big one. Oxalic acid can be a problem in excess. Um, you don't want to go and do like a big spinach, raw spinach smoothie. A, ba a baby, sorry, that's uh, sorry, I just lied. That's not true. It would depend. It's like, so for instance, like this is why context is so important. Context is so, there's so much context that it becomes very, very difficult to have these conversations, let alone with people that don't know what they're talking about or in forum um, places where it's not conducive to the full breadth. And I, you know, even as much as I know, I forget things or misspeak or whatever. And um, so like, uh, um, baby spinach is a lot safer to have than adult spinach. So you could put some baby spinach into a smoothie or I like, I like baby spinach. I have baby spinach salads all the time. There was this idiot one time on, that made a comment on my um, Instagram when I posted a spinach recipe that he doesn't eat that because it's so high in iron. Well, guess what? You know, Shakespeare, um, uh, beef and beef liver that you are eating so much of is way higher in iron than any spinach you could eat. Um, and the reason also being that the iron that's in animal products is way more bioavailable. The, the kind of iron that's in, um, animal products is heme iron, um, which is really, it's almost a hundred percent bioavailable. Whereas the non heme iron that's in plants is, it has, has a very low, uh, bioavailability. Off the top of my head, I really don't remember what the bioavailability is of non-heme iron, but it's very low. It's like, I don't know. It's like, I mean, I just, I really don't even know the number, but it's, it's not even like 50%. Um, so like, so, so the same amount of spinach of iron in spinach quantity of iron that's in spinach compared to beef or liver, you're going to absorb way less of the iron that's actually in the spinach, um, because it's not heme iron. Whereas in the beef or liver, you're going to absorb way too much of the iron and then it's going to cause iron overdose, um, over iron excess. Um, so, and, and that's one of the other, that's one of the other nutritional conflicts that I have with like, I mean, you know, I'm part of the peak community, but, but not really the institutional peak community is just like totally psycho. <laughs> um, they're way more, more about misogyny. I mean, they, they're more misogynistic than they are about health issues. Um, uh, uh. Liver is like really, really high in vitamin, I mean, in, in iron. And it's like, it's like one of the most dense sources of highly bioavailable iron that you can possibly eat. So, you know, when people are trying to get better, they're like, you know, having liver or because they don't like liver, they'll be eating liver supplements and like, don't do that. Um, you guys, supplements are actually really harmful a lot of the times. And, you know, I, and I am somebody that promotes supplements, but like you, you 
cannot, they're not the answer. They all supplements do is supplement. They do not replace nutrients. You cannot just take a supplement because you don't want to eat something. <laughs> if you, if you're not liking what you're eating, you need to get good at cooking. Like you need to just figure that shit out. You know, like watch some fucking YouTube videos, go watch Ina Garten on the food network. Um, you know, like she's lovely. She cooks the best shit. Like just make good food or go eat good food. We got to eat anyway. And that's one of the things with like vitamin K too is like, um, you've got to eat food anyway. What are you eating? Like, is your entire diet just nothing but like stewed apples and, um, supplemental gelatin that's so fucking gross and that's not and that's also why you're not getting better like you need to have a really holistic healthy broad diet with lots of things to eat and it should be fun too you should be eating good shit you know make yourself look look if you don't if you don't want to eat a salad go buy some fucking pesto <laughs> pesto is nothing but basil and olive oil and garlic and it's fucking delicious and just have basil pesto all the time i mean basil oh my god my brain i don't know what's wrong with my brain today um <laughs> go 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 have some um pesto pasta all the time like you know like 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 uh, like or, or put pesto on your sandwiches or whatever like pesto is delicious and and and, and if you don't like uh, pesto is also really expensive so make your own fucking pesto right it's so easy to make pesto. You could make you could make so many batches of pesto, and if all you had for the rest of your life a source of vitamin K was pesto, you'd be great. You know, it, this is one of the reasons why why like the Mediterranean diet and people are so healthy is because of fucking pesto. <laughs> like, you know, just do that. It's, it's, uh, stop taking just fucking supplements for food. It's not it's not how to do things. It just it just isn't. <laughs> so yeah. Um, a word is there no need to worry about what type of K is eaten. It seems a lot of us supplementing use is from people getting to K2. Thank you for asking that because I've totally forgot about the other whole important part about vitamin K. Okay. So for the next hour of this stream, <laughs> we're going to talk about the difference between menaquinone and phyloquinone. So no, I'm just kidding. I'll cover this in just a few minutes. So, um, but, um, okay. So the primary form of vitamin K in um, that we get in our diets is uh, called phyloquinone or vitamin K1. Bacteria take vitamin K1 and make it into what's called menaquinone, which is vitamin K2. And there are at least 13 different types. Oh my God, pesto grilled cheese word. Yeah, that's so good. That sounds amazing. There are at least 13 types of vitamin K2. And we don't even know what they all do. And a lot of supplements are like vitamin K7 or vitamin K4. And the only reason that they are that is because there have been sort of sensational um, um, studies done on those vitamin K2 forms, not because we really know that they're that great to take. And in fact, I think our body actually can also make um, MK4 and that's the only one it can make. But I, the, the science on that is also very confusing. Um. Uh, vitamin K2 is healthier for us than vitamin K1. It's more effective in our body in that form. But the thing is, is that that's also one of the reasons why you need to feed your commensal microbiome vitamin K and not take it as a supplement because there is at least 13 forms and we don't even know what more than two or three of them do. Actually, that's, I mean, we probably know what like four of them do, but not really. We it, it's not good science, and it's not complete science either. We d we don't know, and the bite and your microbiome makes those, and they're better for us than even the normal form of vitamin K, and exceptionally important. Some of them, and I forget which ones, but I think like I, I'm just gonna pull this out of my ass, but like I think like MK4 is like good for your nervous system, right, or something like that. Um, there, the K2 is really, really important. And guess what? If you don't have a gut microbiome, they're not making fucking vitamin K2. And, and if you're not eating vitamin K, they're also not making vitamin K2. There's also a lot of really confusing studies and information out there because literal scientists will say that the microbiome makes vitamin K. That's not true. <laughs> they make vitamin K2. They do not make vitamin K. Bacteria, um, as far as I know, not the ones that live in our gut, cannot just spontaneously make vitamin K. Um, 
I think that like cyogen, cyanogens can make vitamin K. I think like bacteria that are green and they're like sort of algae-ish and algae make vitamin K and plants make vitamin K. I don't think that any vitamin uh, microbes that live in our gut can make vitamin K. Um, they make vitamin K2 from dietary vitamin K. It has to come from plants. Also, I sometimes get people who say like, oh, I'm getting vitamin K from Parmesan cheese. I don't know where the fuck that came from. <laughs> That's not a source of vitamin K. There's some vitamin K2 in cheese because there's a little bit of vitamin K in milk. And there's I know there's a lot of vitamin K production in the gut of a cow that then it gets makes and then the vitamin K makes it to milk. But there's not even remotely as close to the amount of vitamin K in um in cheese that you need for your body. Like you just there's no way you just cannot make that. Like that's that's not how that works either. Um, you it has to come from plants. We have evolved on plants for millions of years <laughs> with a microbiome that has evolved alongside of us for millions of years from eating leaves. That's it. <laughs> that's just, that's it. It's not more complicated than that. That's all the information that you need to know. But if you want to know more, you know, you can like, you know, read that science and stuff like that. But basically like this is a function of a, of being an animal like we are, where we lived under the sun on the African savanna, on the shores of certain lakes, eating plants that were mostly like leaves and other things and uh, and fruit and nuts and insects and and mollusks and stuff like that and and plant plants have always been a very important part of our biology especially in relation to the commensal microbiome that we have evolved alongside with and so when you so when you so when you um so when you don't feed them your health suffers yeah so um so yeah so so like it's fine if you want to supplement vitamin K2. I don't. I haven't supplemented vitamin K in years. Um, I get it from plants. And because your microbiome is the, like, you, the amount that you think you're getting from um, a supplement that you spend, what, like, you know, 20 bucks on, you get way more of that from just eating a fucking salad. You really do. Um, not an iceberg lettuce salad. <laughs> I mean, a salad that has high, that's high in vitamin K. Um I mean, yeah. And so like, uh, like if you just, you know, if you don't really like a salad. Oh, also one of the things I wanted to talk about was enjoying food, like sp literally specifically, like don't, don't, don't tune out yet. Literally, like we're not ending yet. Literally, um, some people don't like vegetables and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm going to tell you why that happens. Like one of the other really big problems that I encounter when I coach people is that people do not understand that what you crave is not a function of your personal tastes. The foods that you like and what you respond to and what you really have a hankering for has nothing to do with your brain. <laughs> it's actually caused by your microbiome. I experienced, I first experienced this when I was first getting well and it was very confusing because, you know, for most of my life, I'd really always loved, you know, comfort food like uh you know like mashed potatoes and pasta and um you know casseroles um and the, and then and that was kind of my diet in like a and but more healthy versions too and I, I rarely had sugar um i like it was one of the things i prided myself on i thought i i, I thought i demonstrated much self-control by never having ice cream or candy or and, um, and I'd have fruit, like I'd, I'd buy orange juice when, when I had money, when it wasn't too, when I could afford it. Um, and, uh, uh, then I got really sick, right. And I get cancer and I just, I nearly die. I'm so sick all the time. I can't sleep ever. And I'm not even being exaggerating. Like I could not, n no night of the week could I sleep for more than 10 minutes at a time. It was horrible. Um, but I find Ray Peeps work and I start getting better and I'm eating like lots of fruit all the time, whole fruit plus orange juice, making myself fruit smoothies, making myself, um, casing protein shake, well, like adding casing to fruit shakes, um, adding, adding even more sugar to those shakes. Um, and like a, like a whole cup, I like, I literally would go through like four pounds of sugar a week. That's how much sugar I was eating, but it was always in, 
it was never like just like sugar water. It was like with other whole food sources of fruit. And that's very important because pectin helps our body and short chain fatty acids made by our microbiome help the body make and I mean, eat and metabolize sugar. If you just drink straight up sugar, you're, you're, that can actually, um, your body can actually not absorb it. And then it stays in your mic, in your gut, and then that can actually derange your microbiome. Uh, sugar is actually best when it's also whole, taken with whole food sources. Like, so you're you're better off, say, for instance, having like um, blueberry or apple pie than you are Coca Cola. That's like a demonstration of like how because the other like pectin help and your mic helps your microbiome helps you metabolize sugar actually. Um, that's really oversimplifying that whole process pathway though too. So, <laughs> but, um, anyway, so I'm like eating tons and tons of sugar, tons and tons of fruit. Um, I'm also like, uh, uh, I didn't have a car at the time because my life fell apart and I was like destitute and I didn't have a place to stay. And I was like staying at friends' houses and I was like taking public transit. So I was like getting sunshine. I was actually getting out, um, in the sun a lot. Um, and then one night and the, well, actually, actually this was later. So, and then by this time I had a car, and I like I eventually got a car after I got my another job my job my first job after all this and um uh one night I just had like the biggest craving for like watermelon and I like I drove at like one I, it would not go away and I could not sleep and so I drove to this grocery store that was open 24 hours and I got a watermelon at like 2 32 in the morning and it was, it was also such a good watermelon. It, that was one of the, I mean, I just, I still remember how that tasted because it was so satisfying. And I, but I also remember thinking how odd that was because I'd never had a craving like that in my life. Um, uh, it was overpowering. And, you know, there's a lot of nutrients in, in watermelon. Like I mentioned earlier, it's a cucurbit. It's high in citrulline. It's high in molybdenum. Also, watermelon is a really potent source of bioavailable um, lycopene and other carotenes that are really necessary for our health. Um, so a lot, there's a lot of beta carot other pro vitamin A carotenes in there that help promote, um, vitamin A synthesis that promotes thyroid and all that other stuff. So there's a lot of reasons that I could have had that craving, but what I also started to notice later after that was an increased craving for vegetables, specifically for very high vitamin K vegetables like collard green. Oh my God. And I would get like I would literally get the same craving for collard greens that I used to have for steak, which I didn't have very often, often, but, and this was even more often then. So I would like, I would just like be like, Oh my God, I want some collard greens so bad right now. Like why? That's such a weird thing to be craving. So I would literally go to the store and I would get collard greens and I bring them home and fry them up. And Oh my God, they're so good. Um, people fundamentally misunderstand that, Trying to get healthier and fix your microbiome is by force feeding yourself foods that you don't like. And that's not how it works, actually. Good news. Um, there is no greater promoter of a healthy microbiome than sugar. Uh, sugar and fruit is the best way to remodel your microbiome because our commensal microbiome microbes primarily thrive on carbohydrates. And, um, when you are, and, and pectin too is a really good, um, is one of the best, um, prebiotic, uh, uh, substrates. Um, not like these other ones. When you, when you see supplemental, um, um, things, uh, uh, prebiotics like, um, I don't know, fructo oligosaccharides or uh, oligos any other oligosaccharides or, um, uh, psyllium husk and all these other things like th those are not good those um and gums too like a lot of emulsifier gums that are used in products like uh, guar gum and stuff like that um they can just indiscriminately feed lots of other microbes that aren't helpful um pectin basically only feeds um a, a short chain fatty acid producing microbes which are the ones that we want um and the, the ones that produce b vitamins and are not harmful to our physiology um uh the amount of fruit and sugar that I was consuming in my early in my recovery promoted my commensal microbiome, which then started making me crave vitamin K. Because the thing is with vegetables, the, the problem, the problem that comes from eating vegetables is that they're very hard to break down. So that that's one of the this is one of the reasons why like where Ray's work is correct and useful but then gets applied incorrectly into your behavior choices that 
yes, it is hard for your body, your body to break down plants. And Ray says this actually, Ray says, um, hello, Blaine. Um, Ray says that plants are better for us, but they're hard to break down. I don't, I think it was, I don't, I don't remember what article he said that in, but I remember reading that. And that's exactly correct. Like the, 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 the amino acids and, and tons of nutrients that are in plants are way healthier for us than animal products. But the thing is, is that animal products are easier for our body to break down. So when you're less healthy and you don't have a good microbiome, you will crave foods that are easier to digest like animal products and refined grains. So if salads seem gross to you and you don't enjoy eating them, it's not that you need to make yourself like those things. It's that your micro, you don't have a good microbiome. You're not able to break down those foods. So you won't really get a lot of benefit out of them anyway. Uh, the, and But then the way that you fix your microbiome isn't by force feeding yourself tons of kale, <laughs> you know, raw kale. It's in eating a bunch of fruit and sugar first because carbohydrate most strongly promotes your microbiome. Um, and this is also, again, another reason why carnivore diet is so harmful and destructive. Um, oh, Blaine, uh, Blaine, you said uh, you don't eat leaves but cook with parsley or cilantro. Yeah, yeah, actually. Well, I mean, it can be enough as long as you use enough. Um, if you, if you put like, you know, a whole bunch of parsley into like a soup or something, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's a good amount. And especially if you do that regularly. Um, um, and especially cause with, when you have other fat in the food, you, you'll absorb more of the vitamin K for yourself. Too much fat can actually interfere with the microbiome. Um, but that's more of a function of your bile. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, um, so, uh, uh. Yeah. So, so including, so yeah, so actually including vitamin K with, <coughs> oh, excuse me. I felt that one coming in a while ago, but, <clears throat> uh, so including vitamin K with, uh, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> that one didn't really get rid of it. Uh, with the other foods that you're eating, uh, is, um, more productive than if you're like, having an ideological meal where you're like, Oh, I'm going to only have a salad. <laughs> um, and, oh, and conversely, actually, I had this idea the other day too. Conversely, um, having more things with when you do have a salad, having more things in it is also a great way to get better nutrition from those other things. So for instance, if you have like a, um, if you have like a, a, sal a baby spinach salad or with, um, what else do people put in salads? <laughs> I keep seeing baby spinach. Um, arugula and, uh, you know, like dark, dark, dark letter, dark lettuce, um, like, like butter lettuce or, uh, the red leaf lettuce. Um, if you have, if you have like a chicken breast in that and cheese, like you're going to get more of that protein into your body than if you just had the chicken breast separate, because a lot of that, if you, cause if you, if you're colonized by harmful micro microbes and have gut dysbiosis or metabolic disease, because, um, if say you were to do that. Um, a lot of the harmful microbes would steal and metabolize that protein in the chicken first before you're able to digest and absorb them. And on top of that, they're going to produce amines that then also cause uh, destructive effects on your body. So, um, so yeah, so like you can actually, so you can also like use a salad or other greens to get better nutrition from other foods if you include them also with your salad. But yes, but um, just having the presence of something high in vitamin K like parsley or cilantro or basil, um, you know, cause when, when we talk about greens too, people's first thought is something like kale and like, you know, kale, if it's cooked right, it can be good. But like, you know, just like people that just go like raw kale, like just don't fucking, it's gross. It's so gross. Um, it doesn't taste good, <laughs> but like I was mentioning, like one of the reasons that that doesn't taste good is like, it's hard to break down. Like plants are, it, plants evolved many defensive strategies to try to impair grazers. Um, so they have anti-nutrients in them. One of the reasons that you don't want to eat raw kale is because one of the anti-foraging um, uh, strategies that plants like that have are um, enzyme inhibitors. So like in raw kale, like if you just eat raw kale, um, there's enough enzyme inhibitors in there that you won't digest it. Um, it'll just come out you whole. And um, and and then in that turn, in that regard, um, you won't absorb any of the vitamin K or calcium or any other nutrient that it has in it. And that's one of the reasons why it tastes bad is because, um, 
uh, because you're tasting those enzyme inhibitors, your tongue knows that they're there. Um, and phytic acid also is a major anti-nutrient. Um, so cooking it, and the good news is that even little tiny amounts of heat are enough to break down enzyme inhibitors. So like, for instance, um, uh, for instance, if you make a flour tortilla at home, like if you make homemade flour, flour tortillas, which I highly recommend, they're fucking amazing. I have a recipe for them on my Patreon, though. That's the only place I've put that recipe up. <laughs> um, link, link below this video. Um, uh, 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 raw, like raw flour. Like if you like, you should try this sometime. If you have like some raw flour or like or or like a whole wheat see uh berries but not wheat um because you know obviously i tell people not to have wheat but like spelt flour um try to chew them raw like if you take if you take some spelt berries put them in your mouth chew them they will never break down <laughs> it's it's the it's the original primordial gum it's like uh like uh like a, a caveman gum it's like if you just chew grains raw they will never break down in your mouth because we do not have enzymes that can counteract the enzyme inhibitors that they possess. So, but if you make like a flour tortilla, you know, when you're making a flour tortilla, you literally only cook it for no more than a minute total. One side, like 30 seconds, and then the other side, like 45 seconds. 45, wait, that is more than a minute. So a minute, 15 seconds. <laughs> I can't, I'm not good at math. Um, that's, as, that's all the heat that you need to break down those powerful enzyme inhibitors. So same thing with vegetables, like one of the reasons to cook them. And that's where that's where the real application of this knowledge comes from. Like the reason that we are the way we are as humans nowadays is because we discovered fire. It allows the fire does a lot of the work that even our normal digestive systems and microbes cannot do. Um, heat breaks down um, plants really, really effectively. And that liberates like, um, vitamin K and calcium and other nutrients while also destroying some of the anti-nutrients that are in there. So because we discovered fire and we're able to cook food, our brains got bigger, our body size got bigger. We, uh, and the brain is the most metabolically demanding organ in the, in the body by far. It burns all the, most of the calories that you, uh, th that's also one of the ironies behind like exercising is like, you can never exercise as much energy as your brain burns in a day. Um, the amount, the amount of calories that you burn from being physically active compared to being sedentary is not very much, uh, at all, um, in terms of your musculature and the brain by far burns way more energy than anything else in the body. And, um, and your body, our body, a lot of our energy burning also, um, is used to make heat. Uh, to keep us very warm. Um, that's the whole point of mammalian physiology. But uh, the brain burns so much nutrient. So because we discovered fire, uh, we actually could acquire an increase in calories because heat destroyed those anti-enzyme, the anti those enzyme inhibitors and stuff like that. And um, and and so then we evolved to be more like what we are now because we had greater access to nutrients like that. Um. <clears throat> But yeah, so so plant plants have evolved many um, defensive mechanisms. So, but the 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 lesson then to apply to your behavior in life from that knowledge is not to avoid them; it's to be more vigilant in your preparation of food, to cook uh, tough foods, to soak beans and legumes properly. If you eat beans and they make your teeth feel chalky, that's phytic acid in the beans, and that is an anti nutrient. You can soak beans long enough, though, like at least like 16 hours. Um, like if you just buy beans out of a can, they're not soaked. So they're going to have a lot of phytic acid. But if you buy dry beans at home, which is also more economical, um, and, and beans are the most potent source of potassium you can possibly get. Um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, I did that right into the mic. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> My cystic fibrosis is acting up today. Actually, I mean, it's been really good because I've been studying it and making progress on it. I can't believe I only coughed once in two hours. So, um, but uh, 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 if you soak, if you buy beans and you soak them yourself uh, for like 16 hours minimum, usually I'll, I'll put I'll put mine on this on the counter, so fill them up with water. Oh, also here's a little trick. If you don't know this, 
So beans are very sensitive to the pH of their environment and the water they're soaking in. If you just fill up a bowl of beans with tap water, they will not soften very quickly at all, like, or they won't even soften at all sometimes because the chlorine in the water acidifies the water um, and, um, and, and they won't take up the water. So if you, you need to add like a little pinch of sodium bicarbonate to the water that you soak beans in, and that will make them soften up very quickly. And in that sense, um, only about six, you only need about 16 hours. So I'll put, I'll put my, um, I'll put my beans on this, on the counter probably in the afternoon. And then, and the next, during the next day, like the morning or noon, I'll, then I'll cook them for like two hours on 400, um, in the oven. And then you get the softest, most yummy beans. And then they don't, then they don't have that chalky, um, effect on your teeth. And that's because the, they've, uh, and to be clear, oh, also to be clear, and a lot of people don't understand this either. I know there's a lot of information in this stream, <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, when you soak beans and stuff like that, the phytic acid is not lost in the water the they possess an enzyme called phytase that then breaks down the phytic acid because they're preparing to sprout this is what we say when we say sprout grains you don't actually have to sprout them and see the root start growing that you just get the process started until um most or all of the phytic acid has been dissolved and that only takes about 16 hours in my in my experience um and and then so then when you cook them then they're very delicious and very bioavailable and safe to eat. Um but yeah, so like so like the lesson the lesson to take from this kind of stuff and like Ray's work is like is not to avoid the natural sources of nutrients that we are so dependent on like vitamin K and vitamin E. It's to mitigate the risk by like eating the forms that are best and safest and using cooking techniques and tools that help to make them safer and easier to digest. Um, and then that way you not only get the food that you need to eat to stay full and hungry and happy, you also get the nutrition to be healthy and also to promote your microbiome, which is the most important part of being healthy is to, is to take care of your gut microbes. So, so yeah, so that was vitamin K. So two hours, huh? Um, okay. So if you guys have any more questions, go ahead and ask, um, when questions stop, we'll, we'll end stream this time. So the more questions you ask, the longer we keep this going. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mentioned I did. We did talk about pesto earlier, word, but like, um, I like literally. I mean, just like, is there anything better than pesto? It's one of the best things that humans have ever made. Like pesto pizza and pesto macaroni. Um, and yeah, and I've had pesto on, on like a chicken sandwich before. Oh my God. Pesto is just so good. And it's such a, hi Jamal. And it's such a, um, it's such a, it, it, and the fact that pesto is so high in vitamin K. Um, and then also when you make it, like when you make pesto, usually it's with olive oil, which is really good for you too. Very high in, um, sometimes, you know, people, a lot of people in these circles are all against polyunsaturated fats. When I say things like olive oil, they get mad at me, but olive oil is higher, highest in monounsaturated fats, which are, which are not the same as polyunsaturated. There's a big difference between those two things. Um, and then garlic, also really good in it and um, stuff. So, yeah. Um, Jamal, uh, uh, you had an experience. You experienced very weak morning. Oh, morning wood. Uh, it's been years actually, but you only recently noticed. Oh, yeah, okay. But no other erectile issues. What might be the case? Okay. So that's a big question. <laughs> um, and also, Jamal, I hope you don't mind um, uh, for anybody that's watching this and listening. Like, Jamal's very young. Like, and I had this problem too. Like, I started having erectile dysfunction at 22, 23. And I had, I had cystic fibrosis, but still, like, um, uh, it, like you know, uh, for young men to start having erectile function issues. Um, hey, fellas. Um, when we're like in our twenties, it's so demoralizing because you don't even get to like live a full life before you start having, um, aging symptoms. Um, there's several, um, factors that go into, um, morning wood. Uh, so, um, first of all, it's testosterone production. Um, when people under eat and don't eat enough, um, and it causes metabolic stress on the body, one of the first things to stop is testosterone production basically. So a lot of people have a lot of, um, nutritional and, um, metabolic stress 
just because they don't eat enough food. And that's one of the first and earliest causes of, um, and I'm saying this mostly not for you, Jamal, but for anybody, um, uh, that induces um, libido problems, especially when you're younger, is dieting. You like you want to you if like if you want your body to stop and don't do this. Actually, if you're listening, I'm being hyperbolic because it's harmful to do. But if you if you want to stop your body from producing production of uh, pr stop producing testosterone, um, stop eating sugar and protein. I mean that that's basically like how your body makes testosterone is with sugar and protein. Um, and so. Um, um, there's other things involved like calcium, which I'll get into, but it's, uh, but, but that's like the underlying foundation of metabolic stress. Um, when you're ill, reproductive issues are some of the last to disappear. But if you want to start having metabolic libido issues, problems, um, uh, uh, nutrient, um, deficiency is, is the, um, a gen my, uh, macronutrient deficiency, like carbohydrate and, um, protein, um, uh, because like in any, any guy, any man, like you'll see this, like if you practice fasting, like if you do, if you do any fasting rituals or dieting, like you just won't feel horny at all while you're doing it. And, and in fact, you might even just, if you're, even if you're, if you're maybe if you, even if your dick works normally, like at other times when you're starving, like it just won't work. And, and it's because, um, the stress hormones that are activated also by nutritional stress directly inhibit testosterone production. Um, testosterone production is a primarily a um, benefit of a of a of a adequately working meta metabolic rate. And there's an except when you do get metabolically ill, stress hormones try to increase your libido, even though your testosterone is not working very well. And that's um, kind of what underlies um, general erectile dysfunction, which then leads people to use erectile medications, which makes it even worse long term. Um, <clears throat> okay, but um, next to that, uh, the fat soluble nutrients, like what we've been talking about, um, have a have a huge impact on um, on testosterone levels and morning wood, and um, vitamin D being one of the best. And I know Jamal that you do actually actively get a lot of vitamin D um, yourself um, from working with you. So, um, uh, so when you have, um, when you don't have morning wood, um, especially if you're young, it means that your body is not really probably managing those, um, your horm your hormones very well, or the, the fat soluble nutrients very well. And so then that is causing you hypogonadism, um, uh, as well as reduce metabolic rate because, um, like, um, vitamin A and carotenes are required for thyroid function and they're also fat soluble. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. And I, I'm saying this and I, I like, I'm realizing it. the reason I'm rambling about it is because I don't know specifically. I can't just tell you one thing to fix morning wood. <laughs> I don't know enough about it yet. Um, I just know generally what helps. So, um, uh, cause the, and the other problem, and so I kind of explained this in my, in my chapter on uh, libido that CO2 production is one of the most important factors for good libido. Um, a lot of people know that nitric oxide facilitates arousal in women too. I say erections and stuff. I'm not talking about just men. Women get erections too. They're just much smaller than men's erections. <laughs> They're only, you know, about half an inch long instead of like, you know, four to 10 inches. So, um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, uh, erections, um, um, are facilitated by nitric oxide, but, Nitric oxide is not the most important factor in arousal. It's actually CO2. So CO2 is made by mitochondria from respiration on carbohydrate mostly. It can also come from fat, but carbohydrate is the biggest promoter of CO2. And CO2 promotes an increased proliferation of mitochondria. So you make even more CO2 and CO2 is highly relaxing to um, vascular physiology. Um, the... Uh, the actual mechanism behind morning wood, which is different because it's entirely possible to have normal erections without having morning wood. But the, the actual fundamental reaction in arousal is that the muscles that close off the cavern, ca, cor, uh, <laughs> corp, 
wow, I can't remember the name of it. Corp, cavern, Corpus Cavernosa, Cor, Cavernosa. Cor, oh my God, what's is it? The Corpus Cavernosa. Cavern, Cavernosum. Yeah, okay, I was saying it right. I just didn't get there. <laughs> Corpus Cavernosum. The muscles that close off the Corpus Cavernosum have to relax to actually let in the blood from your bloodstream. Because if you think about it, your cardiovascular system is always under um, uh, pressure. So if this function didn't work, men would always have, an, uh, have a boner. <laughs> like you'd always be aroused, which would not be very practical. Uh, so, um, so the way that erections work is that muscles tighten and they close off the blood supply. So in order to actually have an erection, they have those th muscles have to relax and then that allows blood flow to go into the penis or the clitoris um, for whichever erection you're having. So this presents another problem because if you have um, low blood volume caused by dieting, stress, excess exercise and stuff like that, you actually don't have enough blood volume to facilitate good erection good erections. So if you have really good erections normally and you don't have morning wood, it's probably a symptom of low CO2 production and or and or um uh probably also vitamin K actually because remember because like early I don't you probably weren't here at the beginning Jamal but like I was talking about how like calcium one of the primary reasons for vitamin K is that it helps our body metabolize calcium. And if you don't have vitamin K in your body, then you can't metabolize calcium. And to, and to the testicles, uh, one of the primary nutrients that they use to make testosterone is calcium. And the, and the testicles have a high throughput of calcium metabolism through them during, um, at all, well, at all times to make testosterone. So, um, and like, so I mentioned in my book too, like actually like men should expose your testicles to sunlight actually quite regularly. The reason that testicles are on the outside of our body is not just temperature regulation as we're often told. It's actually like, and this is also the reason why like the scrotal skin is so thin is because the testicles actually need and benefit from exposure to light. Then light removes nitric oxide off of mitochondria, off of the um, respiration, respiration enzyme, cytochrome oxidase. And then that allows the mitochondrial respiratory chain to actually function correctly. And this is all talked about in my book in the chapter on libido too, actually. It's just so you know, because I'm, I'm not going to, I know I'm not going to remember everything here. Um, and then that allows the mitochondria to respirate. And then in, during respiration, then they produce um, CO2 and that makes them produce more mitochondria. And also then that CO2, when it moves into the bloodstream, relaxes the, um, the, the cardiovascular system. So an increase in relaxation makes the muscles that cut off the corpor corpus cavernosum um, more relaxed so that they're more likely to relax and actually like allow blood flow in there. So, um, when you, so then when you have any kind of erectile dysfunction issues, in women too, and the, the problem with women is that because your boners are so small, <laughs> you don't even really recognize, like if a guy can't get it up, it's really difficult to have sex with a guy, you know, that doesn't have a, a, an erect erection. erection. It's still possible, um, but it's just harder. But women, like you can have sex all the time, even if you're not aroused, right? But um, but it's still very relevant for your pleasure and also orgasming and stuff like that. And, and orgasming for women actually is really important in reproduction. In And I forget, I don't even know what the name of this is because I don't ever study women's reproductive systems because I'm gay. <laughs> but but um, <clears throat> and when I said study, I don't mean scientifically. Um, the back, the very back of the vagina and cervix is um, there's there's like a there's a there's a there's a muscle that actually um, convulses during an orgasm, and that literally sucks semen up into the, into the, um, um, like into the area, like not the fallopian tubes, but before that. I, I, I guess because again, I don't really know. I haven't studied it really, <laughs> but um, but but during, an orgasm, I mean, for women, isn't just for fun. It like literally does also promote um, promote uh, reproduction if you want, like, are trying to get pregnant, and so um, <clears throat> so. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> Whoa, <clears throat> I'm starting to, I'm starting to get through my allotted 
<clears throat> speaking time, I guess. Um, excuse me. So, um, uh, 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 arousal is not just like hedonistic and like for pleasure, although that, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's also, it is actually functional too. So, um, anyway, so very often, um, not getting, um, uh, morning wood is, uh, indicative of insufficient mitochondrial respiration because respiration produces so much CO2 that it helps to relax the corpus cavernosum. And, and at night too, you also actually produce more CO2 than you do during the day, even actually, if you're healthy and you have plenty of glycogen stores. So there can be a lot of reasons underlying it, but vitamin K also like a deficiency of that is, is one. So you might try like, you might try having, um, like I've been talking about having some vitamin K with everything that you eat. Um, I mean, everything that has protein, um, more frequently so that you get better vitamin K uptake. Um, and, uh, I'm sure you eat plenty of carbohydrate, so that's not a problem and you get vitamin D. So that probably isn't a problem. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So respiration, respiration really underlies a lot of erectile dysfunction issues. And then, so if, and if you, if you, if you don't know, there's another stream I did on libido is one of the first ones it's up there so you can go listen to that too and i talk about libido and stuff like that because a lot of people don't understand that nitric oxide is one of the causes of libido dysfunction even though it facilitates normal erections as you start to age and get metabolic disease that nitric oxide migrates from the cardiovascular system into the surrounding tissues where it then inhibits mitochondrial respiration and then causes um, erectile dysfunction. And that state also causes, uh, sex addiction. Um, there's actually no such thing as sex addiction. Sex addiction is actually a biological response to metabolic disease, wherein the body accelerates, uh, mating, uh, impulses to try to, uh, promote procreation before the expiry of the adult. So it's a uh, sex addiction. Isn't actually a thing. It's actually a nitric oxide dysfunction. And I talk about it in that, in that episode as well. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Jorg, you can't seem to raise your body temperature no matter what you do. Well, actually, Jorg, I would say I, you've been in here before, and I don't think you you say no matter what you do, but I kind of get the impression that you don't do whatever you do. <laughs> um, because like uh, I, I I think Jorg, I think you I think you kind of only change your diet as much as it's convenient for you and you don't really stick to like a diet that I, um, recommend. I have, I have step by step guide for increasing your body temperature in the chapter on self therapy. Um, using things like milk with sugar and gelatin, sunlight exposure, eating vitamin K. And if you're doing all those things, it's, you can totally raise your body temperature. And I, I I'm not sure that you're doing all of those though. Um, you know, many people who don't eat healthy. Well, yeah, well, so that's not, but that's not a good barometer. Like, um, uh, and, and that's also not true either. Um, people who don't have great diets and look great, um, might look great now, but it doesn't mean they're going to look great in the future. Like thinking that they're going to look that good forever and ever. That's a real logical fallacy. A lot of people, you know, when you're, when you're a child, you can get away with eating a lot of shit. Um, and part of the reason for that is children's bodies are designed by nature to uh, greatly resist pathogenic colonization of the body. And so they don't suffer consequences of eating really bad diets. So then you get to be a young adult and you're still benefiting from that physiology, but you still have the same crappy diet and which also might even get worse. And you don't start to see the consequences of that until years later. Um, that doesn't mean that what they're eating that they're impervious to those bad diets that they have, those bad diets will eventually catch up to them. Um, but one of the big factors behind it are pathogens. Like, and that's a big hallmark of my work is that like, you know, there are so many parasites, viruses, fungi, and um, bacteria that cause us metabolic disease. Um, and their function in that is, really hard to understand. Um, and it has a lot to do with our diets, but they're separate from our diets as a cause of disease. So you can get people who are colonized by say with like, um, H pylori, for instance, won't produce very much stomach acid. So then, um, 
<clears throat> even if you have a healthy diet, you won't benefit from it a whole lot because you aren't producing stomach acid where you'll get people that don't have a great diet but are, don't have H. pylori and have great um, stomach acid production digest and break down everything that they uh, that they eat. Um, so, you know, there's fact so there's factors like that. But I, I but from what you've told me, Jorg, I don't think you really do adopt entirely the kind of diet that I advocate. I could be wrong, but um um is it a big problem if your spouse has pathogens and you kiss have sex? Well, I mean, if your spouse does, you do too. If your spouse doesn't, I mean <laughs> that's Jorg, that's not how that works. Your spouse does not have pathogens and you don't, you have them as well. And you could have probably been the one to give them to them too. Uh, your spouse having diseases is has nothing to do with your spouse. Like herpes has been around for millions of years. Your spouse, you know, didn't make it <laughs> or, or like HPV or H pylori. Like, so, um, yes, you can pass pathogens back and forth and that can make it very hard to eradicate them, but you can both get treated. Like if you both go get a shot of ceftraxone, which is a, uh, 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 shot that's commonly used to, uh, address STDs. It also wipes out oral microbes. Um, if though your spouse, you know, for instance, cheats on you and brings pathogens into your relationship, that's always a risk too. Um, but the thing is, is that like, you know, your ability to resist those pathogens is also relevant. And a lot of people can be really slutty and just not pick up diseases because their health is so good. Um, and that's rooted in the kind of diet that they had as children diets, high in fruit and stuff like that. And like I mentioned earlier, like I was talking about, like, um, the commensal microbiome benefiting directly from proline made by our bodies from citrulline from cucurbits, um, kids that grew up with diets high in cucumbers and watermelon are very resistant to disease, um, for that reason. And so, so like, so evaluating like dietary validation based on how someone looks is, is, is a, is, is a, um, is not at all how it works. Um, and and that's why there's so much like disinformation and dysfunction in health and fitness and wellness too, is because you get people, uh, advertising products and systems that are in their twenties and muscular and they are not, they do not look like a sexy fucking Greek God because of their diet uh, at right now or what they're doing right now or working out. They are they look that way because of what they ate when they were children and what their parents ate also when they were pregnant with their those children. Um, <clears throat> uh, um, so there, they, there's, you, can, you can have up to 20, 30 years of dietary factors going into how, how somebody looks. Um, that that's that's completely separate from what they're doing right at the moment so hello hunter is the book the best place to start uh with learning more on or patreon oh no i don't i don't have very much information on patreon actually at all patreon's more just of a um people support my general work there and then i share some i share i'll share like um i'll share supplemental stuff like if i make discoveries or things with them there um in fact, there's one very important one on sodium and chloride that I put up recently. Um, uh, and, uh, 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 most the, everything really is in my book. Um, it's the bulk of all of my, um, and also somebody asked early, uh, earlier too. Oh, Blaine, you asked, you asked a uh, book update. So, um, I am also currently working on, uh, uh, an update to my book that will be released I keep saying a few weeks or months and I keep lying because the research just takes <laughs> so cuz I mean I can't I, you know I can't will the research to be done I have to figure it out. Um and I've been working on it um and so I've been saying for quite a while now that it was it is going to be soon but it is going to be soon. I I've, I've already made so much progress on it. It's going to be released soonish a few months probably. Um uh <clears throat> and um so if you like, if you buy the ebook and I give it free to anybody that already has the ebook. So if you want to get the book and you can just buy it and then I'll, I'll release the update and then the update, I detail what has been changed and updated in the release when it's released. Um, so you don't have to wait for the release if you don't want, if you want some of that information now. Um, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So yeah, the book the book is the bulk of my um, information. Whereas like Ray Peets was work where his articles and things like that. Everything I talk about is mostly in my book. So um, thanks for asking that though. All right, my voice is shot. Um, it's got to be the end now. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming by. Um, this was a nice time. Um, let's see. Yeah. So like I said, uh, book update coming in a while. Keep an eye out for it. Um, if you are not signed up, I, oh, I should put up my threads. Um, I'm on threads now. If you're there, it's kind of a dumb app, but, um, I mean, I like the design, but nobody can see any posts because all it does is promote, uh, influencers and famous people. Um, but, uh, but, uh, I'm on Twitter. The links to my social media are below, uh, in this video. Um, yeah. Thank you, Blink. Um, thanks for participating. Um, yeah, and so if you don't know, this is what we do all the time. I get on and we chat and answer questions. So um, we'll do that in the next stream if you missed this one. If you're watching the VOD, um, make sure to attend a new another one in the future. You can come along and ask questions, get my book, support my work. Um, follow me on YouTube here and um, like and comment on the video promotes its distribution. Yeah, just and, and you know, tell people about my work and uh, you know, I couldn't do this without your guys' support. I really appreciate it. You guys are really supportive. Um, so yeah, hope you have a really good rest of your week and that it's not too hot where you live. <laughs> and if it is, uh, stay cool and stay, uh, keep your electrolytes up. Uh, thanks so much and I'll see you guys later. Bye.